Welcome to the show today. We are continuing a, a series of, uh, you know, where do we go? Where do we go to find freedom? And today I have on the line some good friends, uh, Sloan and Jack. Hi, guys. Thanks for being on today. Hey, Shepard. Thanks for having us. Hello. Good to see you again. Same back at you. So will you guys tell me just briefly, maybe Sloan, if you'll start, just tell me a bit about yourself and then I'll ask you, Jack, and then we'll get into the meat of this. Well, my name is Sloan and I live a pretty nomadic lifestyle. Uh, we have an RV that we travel around in seasonally and it's getting to a point uh, that I feel like we'll hit on later. Um of with political heightness of things that it's time to find somewhere to plot ourselves. It's time to find the land. It's time to find a place to build community and um, start to just be more self-sufficient. And it's pretty awesome to be free on the road, but there's certain things that come with finding land that you're able to do. And so that's kind of where my mind is these days, navigating that area and that arena. Um, and then Professionally, I provide counseling services through the Agora. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, welcome, Sloan. Uh, Jack, who are you? Hey there, yeah. So um, I, um, as well, I'm uh, semi-nomadic, I guess, and I'm a volunteerist, I guess you might, uh, that might be the most um, broad term for me, an agorist. I try to live an, an agorist lifestyle. I'm sure most of your listeners know all about that, agorism. Um, so I, you know, I try to the greatest degree possible to ignore, uh, you know, the state to the greatest degree, uh, that is possible without getting in trouble. And, uh, so part of that, uh, entails, um, I guess, uh, living, uh, as much as possible in relationships with other like-minded people. And uh, that's kind of what brought us here to your podcast today is uh, to talk about what we're trying to do to make that happen. Wonderful. Well, welcome, Jack. And to kind of get things set up, I'll just chat a minute about my thoughts and, and, and what I've been doing. And then, and then let's jump into it. And then I'd like you guys to kind of drive the rest of the show. Um, basically, what I'm noticing is that there are millions of people today that are really concerned about the disastrous presidencies of Trump and then now uh, the what's the other kid uh, Biden that's in there now and these guys are following up eh, about 240 years of disastrous presidencies before them and it just it's not like things are getting better and better it's not like we're getting more and more freedoms and a lot of people are seeing from all persuasions they're saying you know things aren't looking that great and we kind of want to escape this decaying society and this is a it's not it's, it's bipartisan but then it's also nonpartisan i think all of us on this screen um don't really feel that you need a master or that we need masters and so we're we're of the voluntarist ilk and and then i think as a as a uh, what's really going on, and, and it's not a, a big secret. I remember George Carlin talking about the the media and central banks and governments and special interest non government organizations. And, you know the the favor seeking corporations, and he said it's a big club and you ain't in it. And and I think he summed it up really well. So it's not really that much of a, a fringe movement anymore. I guess years ago it was, but now it's a pretty mainstream thing. People are just saying, okay, I understand. I'm not going to maybe beat the tide. The people who just love Trump or love Biden and think everything that they do is perfect. We're, maybe we can't beat that. Maybe we can't beat what uh, George Bush called the new world order. Or maybe we can't beat all of that stuff. But let us just kind of go find some little corner. And will you please let us just go there and, and hide and live our lives and we won't hurt anybody. Uh, we just kind of want to get away from everything and just kind of go have our, our privacy and mind our own business and, and not hurt anybody. And I think there are a lot of people like this, classical liberals, uh, conservatives, voluntarists, libertarians, a lot of different types of people. And I kind of break it down into two, two ways that, that people might escape. And one would be to join a big group of people and buy a couple hundred acres and everybody gets an acre and, and your, your own community. And then the other type would be something like new state, uh, not new state, the free state project uh, in Wyoming and New Hampshire, 
where a bunch of people say, yeah, let's just kind of go to this area and, and try to take hold and, and make ourselves a good life there. I was reared in a Mennonite community, which is, is kind of like the first option where a bunch of people just moved to an area and said, we're all going to buy up land around here. Uh, so I guess it was more like the second option I'm talking about. They all just happened to buy land in the same area and formed a, a good community. So that's kind of what we're going to chat about today is which of these options is better? Where is a good place to go? What are some of the factors that we're going to consider? Um, it, it, am I kind of in line with what you guys are thinking as well? When it comes to the need to get, find somewhere? Yes. Correct. Yes, we are definitely in line with uh, that mentality, <laughs> trying to find somewhere to um, put ourselves. And what does it mean to go in with community? Uh, we have a group of like-minded people who agree that the number one principle is non-aggression, who agree that um, no, or one of the agreements that we try to put forward and want to make sure is highlighted is you don't call in um, law enforcement. So what does that mean to take care of things on your own? Like our property is our property. And and when I say ours, whoever goes in on the land, we are probably leaning more towards the option A, where you find a huge acreage that um, provides water and trees. And like, how do you get something that's not in the desert and not in a flood zone, but it has like all of the natural resources that you could use to be self-sustaining and then enough space to make it look like there's nothing there so you also hide yourself from society sort of and you're close enough to society in case you still need to work grid stuff um those are all considerations i feel like we're taking into account um and then i like your option b and i think that that provides an option for uh, people who may not want to navigate what does it mean to live in community on the same property what does it mean to find an llc or trust or uh how does the land get divvied up through the title and all of that stuff and instead they're like okay you guys have a community here i want to buy some land right next to it and expand it a little bit more <laughs> so i think we're open to all of that um and i think where our kind of umbrella of where we're looking is more of a factor right now because there's certain geographical areas that um, are of main particular interest for us. And so what are your thoughts on, you know, when we think about locations, um, you know, Los Angeles has just a wonderful climate, but there are too many people and it's really expensive. Um, you can get great deals on land in the middle of the Mojave Desert probably, but it's not real comfortable. So what are you guys kind of leaning toward what are you thinking these days what would be a good neck of the woods to, to maybe put some roots down so i'm gonna hold up a book real quick um this is strategic relocation by joel skousen and it is the main document we use as our founding research for all of the land stuff. And so we have taken into consideration the banana belt of Idaho with some of the counties along Washington and Oregon and Montana um, that would fall into that. And then the region of the Ozarks, like the just the borderline between Missouri and Arkansas and Arizona um, in the northeastern side where there's a, a huge aquifer underneath under the ground and it's a lot of pine forests and juniper trees so those are the three main areas we're looking at um jack do you want to add anything yeah th those who have talked to me about this undoubtedly have heard of strategic relocation because i always uh, recommend it it's a little pricey it's about 35 bucks but i think it's well worth it for anyone planning to move in the next couple of years um, and it, it's not that that's the only thing we take into consideration, but it's one of the only resources that's got the vast majority of data that you might want um, to use to make your decision on uh, in one resource. And of course, there's other you know personal preferences that might uh, throw you outside of some of the recommended areas. But he does uh, go into very uh, you know high detail about all types of data in different areas and. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that's uh, kind of the basis for where where we're sort of looking. Also taking into consideration a few other factors. Right. Well, and you know, it's interesting. And I, I'm familiar with his book. I know his brother. Just I 
had lunch with them a couple times. I don't know them well, but definitely an interesting libertarian-ish family. Brother Mark is is more of a statist, but uh, uh, Joel's book I've just heard rave reviews about. And I, recently I found a resource on Cato, which is again a, a pro-state organization, but somewhat libertarian-leaning. And they had this, this fun app or option on their page where you can put in the things that are uh, that you're most interested in, the liberties that you're interested in, and it tells you which states are better. And I did that for, I was really leaning toward Arkansas in my land search because it's inexpensive. You can get a lot of it and you're hidden in the trees. And I was thinking that, and then I looked at it and it was not that great on the list, whereas Missouri was just wonderful. It was high up on the list. I think only behind Florida and New Hampshire and Tennessee for the the areas that I was interested in uh, that particular day after that particular beer. Uh, but it's interesting, the different resources that that uh, are out there for places. Uh, when was that book written roughly? Do you recall the, isn't it now 20 or 30 years old? Yes, well, this... but he updated it uh, just recently, 2020. Oh, wonderful. And he's, and it... and he's included re reactions to the COVID. Uh, oh, wonderful. You no. Know, Hell, hella blue there so yeah great and so and does he talk at all about which counties or states have the easiest sub uh, rules for subdivision etc for hunks of land or does he get yeah into he goes that? into very detailed information about uh, water tables in the area arsenic levels in the water uh, state taxes property taxes uh level of corruption in local government state governments um Wonderful. Growing season. Yeah, the growing season and anything you could possibly imagine, demographics, religious demographics, uh, uh, racial demographics, political demographics, um, you know, just about anything you'd want to know about the area. And then, of course, you can make your decision as to what's important to you or not. Maybe the arsenic level in the water is not important to you. And so you're going to completely ignore that data, right? Right. And so, and I've got to say something because we're talking about Northern Idaho is one of the places. And then we're talking about the Ozarks. And, you know, if we're going to look at what most people think, people from the Ozarks are kind of like the people from the Appalachians, which is where I was reared. They're just a bunch of dumb hillbillies. They're backward and, and all the women have cigarettes hanging out of their mouths and they're, they're pregnant and barefoot. And, <laughs> and it's just a, a really backward society. And then what is the generalization about Northern Idaho, a bunch of white supremacist uh, KKK guys up they're just trying to get away from it all so they can still be racist. Um, and so uh, none of us are, I don't think any of us right now are pregnant or smoking cigarettes or barefoot. Um, what about the, the racist part of it? Um, I see there's a movement to put white males down, but I don't really care because I'm 1% black and I've got some Jewish blood in me. So you, are you guys interested in a community that is primarily white or, uh, I mean, are you part of that kind of white supremacy movement or are that's you? That's not much of a, con for me, that's not much of a consideration at all. It's mostly, um, I'm looking for, and I think Sloan probably as well, and most of the people in our group are looking for um, water resources, natural resources in the area. We're looking for rural areas where the where the politics are not likely to affect you quite as much those are our our main factors um for looking into the area uh, and would you yeah. from your perspective would you be okay if uh gay or transgender people wanted to come into the community or if uh black people or asian people mexicans i i mean are you open to that or is it would you prefer to keep it uh kind of straight laced conservative what are, what are your general thoughts on that um our group in particular and sloan hinted at this but we've uh, we formed kind of a i guess you call it a mutual aid society with uh, a whole bunch of people in there and um that's not a consideration for our group we have um various different uh, ethnicities and religious preferences in our group um sexual orientations so yeah we're our, awesome. our main our main um, consideration is do people understand the zero aggression principle and are they committed to live that that's our main um, you know I guess baseline for acceptance into our community. I love that. I really don't care about any of that other stuff. If my neighbor's doing it. As long as if I say, hey, will you help me lift this into the wheelbarrow? They're like, oh, yeah, of course I will. And as long as they don't tell me what to do or that kind of stuff, like, okay, I think we can get along. Uh, I think we can get along with just about anybody. Uh, so 
you mentioned three areas that you're looking at. Um, and are, are you thinking of a, like you might buy them all and then sell off little lots to people? Or are you thinking about a long-term lease? There's a project going on in Arkansas now where there's a, they're, they're offering 999 year leases. That's the business plan. What are your thoughts on how you might structure your project? Um, I think I'll take a dive at this and let Jack fill in the blanks, <laughs> but, um, so one of the ways that we've been really looking into this is how do we set up a trust and then allocate whoever puts in or whatever the total price is for the property, divide that by however many acres. And then if you want an acre, like you put in that much, if you want 10 acres, you put in that much, um, or you put in that much over time, like that can be worked out and then you own that. And then what the, where the tricky part is going to come in is like, what happens when you die? You can't really just will it to somebody if they're not part of the, like if they're not either part of the community or if they don't also agree with non-aggression principles, zero aggression and self-defense. Um, and so what does that look like? If you don't want to be part of the community anymore and you want to sell it, uh, I think one of the things we're considering is like, what does it mean to sell back to the community before selling out so that we can resell it to somebody who's part of uh, the either in our community or part of the greater community of people who agree with non-aggression. Um, what am I missing, Jack? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's about it. I think, um, and I did read your your um, article, Shepard, about voluntary communities on uh, open vo openly voluntary, and uh, that makes some really good points there uh, in our group in particular, we have a very high level of trust among members. Um, there's quite a vetting process. People have to be known and trusted in real life and vouched for by people. And so we have such a high level of trust that it's facilitated making a land purchase. In fact, we've made we've recently made a, a small land purchase for the group um, for, a, I guess, a refuge or um, a, a bug out or emergency place for people to go if they need a place. And that went fairly smoothly. Um, we don't have issues with trust as far as people handling the money and um, because we've taken care to, to carefully vet people in the community. So I think it may make it a little bit easier for us um, on, a, on a bigger project. Um, at least that's the hope, right? And uh, I also wanna point out that with your plan A, there could be a couple of different scenarios. Some people are looking for what they would call an intentional community. And what they mean by that a lot of times is like a commune where everybody shares the same land and everyone's expected to do certain things. And that's not what we're looking for. I, I don't feel like that's, it's not attractive to me personally. And I also find that those, I haven't found many examples of communities like that that have actually worked. Uh, so we're like Sloan mentioned, uh, looking more at an option of where we're just kind of going to subdivide it in house and you can do whatever you want to on your lot. So it's basically kind of like option B in that you're just um, having neighbors move in next to each other. Um, okay. Maybe in more like a covenant controlled community or subdivision type thing, you know, with very light rules, like, like she mentioned, you know, non-aggression and whatnot. Okay. There was a, a interview that I tried to listen to. Um, but the, and the, the guy that was hosting it uh, is a, a popular libertarian talk show guy, but he brought up a brilliant point, uh, and I'll see if I can remember them, of the three things that he looks for, yeah, and kind of the two primary ones are, what do I have to do to be in this community? What can't I do if I'm going to be in this community? And uh, then I forget what the third one is. I'll, I'll research it and put it up on the... Uh, overlay on the screen here but i thought that was kind of a neat way is is what am i required to do and you guys mentioned uh self-defense what is that what are you playing with there what are you working with as a, a requirement for self-defense i think i when i mentioned that i was just meaning that you have a right to self-defense like when i say zero aggression that doesn't mean that somebody can just come tackle you and keep beating you and you don't do anything to protect yourself um so to just to understand that some sometimes if there's a bad situation which i don't feel like is going to come from within the community but if you're threatened from outside forces and um you have total right and responsibility to protect yourself and your own and <laughs> you, the people you call community <laughs> right 
Yeah, and, it, and that's kind of an interesting thing is that we're midstream. When I think about the whole self-defense thing, uh, when you talk to somebody that's pro-state, one of the things they would say why they believe state is needed is for protection. What do you do when there's a child molester? What do you do when there's a bully? That kind of thing. And it is difficult midstream because even if we ended up in uh, Ravenden, Arkansas, and we all we, there was a big community and then there were other people living nearby, if one of us discovers that another one of us is doing something that's really, truly bad, aggressing against others, um, then the decision would have to be made. Do we take care of it as a community? And if we take care of it in the way that I think I would be drawn to take care of certain issues, then I go to prison for the rest of my life. So might there be times, and I, I would think that you would agree that if we have reason to believe that a member of our community is doing truly nasty NAP violation things, we're not going to have a public hanging, even though that might be appropriate, that might be what we contracted to. We do kind of live under the, we live in an area that a county government thinks they have control and the state government thinks they have control. So might, if there's a homicide or a child molestation, what are your thoughts about calling in the government since they exist until they disappear, calling them in for something like that? You know, there's definitely scenarios where you can't avoid calling the state in, I suppose, because, uh, you know, we're we're not in an isolated uh, country. Right. Um, and, and I and I feel like one of the main uh, uh, goals for us is to not make a lot of noise about the fact that we've got this intentional community going, because I feel like, as you mentioned in your article, you know, that can draw attention and. Um, you know, we don't want to make a lot of noise about, hey, we've got this community going and we don't want to be advertising it. It's just, you know, very low key. Um, just want to live in, we just want to live peacefully among good neighbors. So. Um, what a radical yeah. idea. I know. <laughs> well, and then I, know. I would just add on the part about what it means to call police when you don't necessarily believe in that need or to want to have a people to have authority over you. Um, I think when those scenarios present themselves, that in and of itself can be an act of self-defense because if you don't, then you could be held accountable um, and arrested by them if they find out. Okay, right, right. Um, so as you're looking at this, uh, these various projects, that's ec excellent that you already have a, a small property. That's wonderful. W what is the what is the next step? And I, we're certainly not inviting everybody who happened to be watching Odyssey today to join the community because it isn't a, you know, not handing out free passes. It's a quite the process. Um, what should someone who is listening and says, you know, I, I would be interested in a community like this. They should pick up the book, which I'll put a link to in the description. Um, what else would you tell that person? Should they be in touch with you? Should they just read that book and go start their own thing? What are what are some of your thoughts about what a, a like-minded uh, radical libertarian, uh, like a complete peace activist, humanitarian, non-aggression principle kind of person, um, what would your recommendation be to them? Well, I certainly wouldn't be uh, opposed to talking to people about it um, and uh, helping them out because I think it's a great uh, thing for people to to get involved with. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not opposed to uh, you giving out some limited contact information. Um, you know, I'd be happy to help help people or go over what we're doing, and compare notes, that type of thing. Wonderful, wonderful! What a great resource. Um, because, uh, you know, I'm finding as I, as I go along, other, other people have thought of this before, uh, you know, Ayn Rand wrote about it and, and, and Galt's Gulch is, is people kind of getting tired of stuff and deciding to shrug and go have a better neighborhood that they're going to live in. Um, so yeah, it's not, certainly not a brand new, uh, idea. Uh, what, what are you thinking? Have you done any numbers, any projections yet on what buy-in might be to start with? Or is this something that somebody could come into with 5,000 or would it take $50,000 or 500,000 or what, have you done any of those number crunching exercises yet? A little bit. We've been talking to, uh, realtors and we've been talking to um, financing people just to see if that's an option or would we rather just uh, purchase it outright and uh, just to kind of see what that would look like we're in that we're in that stage right now so I don't have any 
you know, answers. I'm looking forward to maybe some feedback in the comments on your video from, you know, some critiques or suggestions from your viewers as well. Um, but yeah, there's there's uh, there's a few ways you can go about that, I suppose. But we don't ha we haven't um, solidified any of that yet. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be interesting how much you know. And I completely agree with you, Jack, about the the commune not being of incredible interest. And then at the same time, there are certain things like that in my upper middle class subdivision. Um, we have a third of an acre lot and a decent sized house, so that there's. Yeah, there's not very much lawn, but I have a nice zero turn uh, lawn mower that I've had for 15 years now. I just love the thing. Well, our neighbor next door, why would I go out there and watch him spend two hours pushing his push mower when I can just zip through it in 10 or 15 minutes on mine? Neighbor on the other side, I do it with them. Well, it just so happens they come over with their snowblower and blow the snow out of out of my area. And we loan things back and forth. And it doesn't always make sense for every single neighbor in a 20 person neighborhood everybody doesn't need to have a big steel chainsaw you know maybe we could cooperate some and trade with each other i i, I like that idea of kind of combining uh the idea of common goods uh but I, I think the best way to do that is not make them common keep them private and as long as you treat me nicely, you get to use my zero turn mower and I get to use your other thing. And if you don't treat me nicely, then you don't get to use it. And then I have to find another way to get a snowblower. It'd be interesting experiment to watch how the community would develop. I've had some conversations with uh, some of our members who are considering to go in on land and um, I get where you're coming from of keeping it private. And the other, the flip side to that is what does it mean to pull resources to get the best of the best and maybe a couple replacement parts so that there's longevity so that it doesn't break down. Or if it does, we have some pieces to fix it up um, so that the community can use it. And you just do that for anything and everything you might imagine, the snow plow, the, the field tiller, the um, lawnmower that you're talking about, just the things that would keep life moving at a more convenient pace <laughs> how do we get the best of that and how do we have responsibility for it is definitely things are, that are on my plate that I'm considering yeah I think the free market is so wonderful about working things out my wife and I looked at a, a property two days ago a 77 acre property and it's uh, off grid and it there's a driveway that there's one house that the people live in beyond it well they plow their way in it's in the Rocky Mountains so it's snowy they plow their way in and then when this place came up for sale the owners said hey you know, give you 50 bucks to come and just plow the driveway out so the realtor can get in and show people. And so they they did it. And it just, it worked beautifully. And it, I'm sure if we end up buying this place, we'll jump in and offer half, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of paying um, <laughs> for, for part of their plowing expenses. Um, I think free market, people just seem to get along and take care of each other and do things well and nicely and right. It's a good thing. Um, what have we not talked about in our brief chat here that might, uh, we have uh, just a, a, about another five minutes, it looks like, until uh, uh, Zoom will ask us to leave without paying them, and uh, which they absolutely have a right to do. What haven't we chatted about that we ought to? Well, I know that one of your questions I found interesting um, that are listed on your openly voluntary uh, little forum. Uh, you asked, how does the vegan eaters get along with the uh, the pig wranglers or something like that? <laughs> and I thought that was really interesting because Jack and I happen to be vegan. And then we have um, other people in the tribe who are most definitely carnivore <laughs> so like and we've talked about this and I don't know um if you've heard of different youtubers that are homesteaders and they just do their life online or whatever but there's a couple of them and they're about regenerative uh, agriculture and I think where like the piece of that can come in is utilizing animals to bring the soil and the ground back so that the ground is nourishing you through the food that you're eating. Um, 
I feel like there's a whole cycle of life to that. And I probably am not, <laughs> I'm probably going to offend a lot of vegans out there, like mainstream militant vegans, because I feel like everything has its purpose. And we became plant-based for more health considerations than anything else. And um, the way that we've had conversations around that, it just seems like it'll work um, as long as long as they like keep the killing process to the other side of the acreage <laughs> and do your thing. But I don't see why we can't commune together and like hold space for each other in the sense of like everybody has their beliefs about what makes them healthy, um, what is good for them. And I, per- I believe one way and you believe another way. And if I'm not hurting you and you're not hurting me, if then of course other people are going to be like, but you're hurting the animals. But I don't like, I don't necessarily feel like the nap goes beyond the people with um, the human species per se. Um, yeah. Probably saying a couple things that are going to get me. <laughs> uh, it's good to get them out there though, right? Comments. True story. But yeah, so I just wanted to comment on that because I saw your question and your uh, listing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that would be important to just lay the groundwork. Good fences make good neighbors. And if, if at the beginning you lay the groundwork and say, hey, there are going to be people in here who are going to have children that are going to be running around screaming loudly. There are going to be swingers in the community. There are going to be pig sw- farmers. There are going to be people that like guns. There are going to be people that hate guns. You can't go initiate violence getting against anybody. Is that cool? Like, I think as long as everybody can answer yes to that, well, okay, we'll go from there. Jack, did you have anything to add? Proselytize. What was that? And I said, and preferably don't proselytize whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Homes. Unless you want to around the campfire. And around my campfire, please, please do for a little bit until, yeah, yeah. What do you have to add, Jack? Well, I think that's about it for me, unless you got something yourself. No, I think this has been productive. And I think that this... Uh, a big part of what we're doing is just getting the comments rolling. So I would ask everyone that is uh, either listening to this on uh, SoundCloud or on one of the other platforms or on uh, odyssey.com uh, uh, or YouTube, please do leave comments, challenge us, even if it's little stuff. If we don't work it all out ahead of time, then we're going to run into problems. So there, I'm sure things we haven't thought of. Please toss them out there. I'll even add them to that. Uh, well, I'll link the website down below. It's openly voluntary. Uh, actually, if you just Google or DuckDuckGo, openly voluntary Freedom Land, you'll find the article. And it's just kind of a, a working copy that I'm adding to, uh, kind of a light version of Skousen's book, I guess. Uh, just, let's toss out some ideas and, and yeah, maybe make better lives for ourselves. So Shepard, yes. there's one thing I wanted to mention. There's another book I'm reading that I'm highly recommending for everybody in our community that wants to go in online together, and it's called Creating a Life Together. And it's written by people who have w- witnessed the, the attempt and the fall apart of communities and the ones that actually right. stay together and are productive. Um, I can send you that PDF so you can uh, share that if you'd like. That'd be um, wonderful. And then I... Jack, if you're up for it, um, just throwing some pointers out to why sticking to the states is um, our viable option over heading to Mexico or South America or something. Uh, are you asking me for my thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, well, I've, I've lived uh, in Mexico for well over 10 years, close to 15, um, full time most of it, and um, really enjoy Mexico. I know there's a lot of anarchists and voluntarists and agorists that are going down there. I uh, really enjoy it. I love the weather. I love the growing season and the fruit and the food and the economy and, and everything and the people. And um, I just feel like it's not a safe place. If you feel like the an, an SHTF scenario is going to happen and things are going to fall apart here and we're going to have martial law and liberty people rounded up and or the lights are going to go off or something like that. Um, I've got a lot of reasons for for um, believing that it's very dangerous for foreigners, non-Mexicans to be in Mexico. Um, and uh, so I have specifically left Mexico for those reasons to come back here where I'm from. And I know the back roads and I know the language and I can blend in and I know how to dress and um, 
okay. and that's coming from a person I'm fluent in Spanish. I've native fluency in Spanish. And so I, and I'm fluent in the culture. So I, I'm very comfortable living in Mexico, but as long as things are peaceful politically, um, and if anyone's got, you know, specific questions about that, I'm happy to, to share my experiences again, if they contact you, maybe, you know, you can, you can pass them on to me or something like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. That's a that's a good point because that was uh, one of our actually episodes in this uh, series was uh, talking to my friend Nathan uh, who lives in Mexico and has for some years and it has great getting all the different ideas and perspectives and considerations. Well, thank you guys so much for being on today. I look forward to chatting with you both again in the future. I look forward to following your developments and uh, yeah, let's keep everybody posted on the webpage and thanks again for joining me. Thanks, Shepard. Have a good one. Take care.